Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Alleluia. Welcome to the second Sunday of Advent. And for some of you, you might wonder, like, hey, aren't you supposed to be up in front teaching tomorrow? It's Sunday, not Monday, because I like to get my days mixed up and things like that. But um, and a bit of sad news I have to deliver is that uh, if you have not heard, Pastor Lee is actually in the hospital right now. He had a mini stroke on Friday, uh, was looked to be at discharge yesterday, but the doctors decided to hold him overnight again for observation. So we will be praying for him as well, that he will uh, be returning to us shortly. So I have been asked to lead service today, and I will also be leading service next week for our uh, children's program from the preschool for uh, Christmas. So that will be uh, pretty good. So if you don't like me too bad, you got me there. <laughs> this week and next week. Uh, so as we begin here, uh, hopefully things will work a little bit better because we had to kind of do this a little bit on the fly, but that's okay because the Lord loves us nonetheless. And I even have a sermon that I can deliver uh, today, uh, courtesy of Pastor Shower from our district, who is uh, gracious enough to provide that for us. Uh, you can tell I definitely did not write it because it's going to reference both Tom Petty and Bob Dylan. And if you know me, those are just my favorite whiny singers. But uh, it's a very good sermon overall. I read through it and prepared for it. And uh, we thank Pastor Shower for that very much across there. And so let's pray before we or as we uh, begin service. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here today, gathered together. We pray for Pastor Lee with his health struggles that are going on. There's much, so much stress in the world today. The anger that we see, the torment, the war, everything that is going on around us. We turn to you. We have faith in you. We have knowledge and belief in you that you will lead us, that your will will be done. And through you, all things can 
and will be able to be done. We ask that you bless us in our congregation today, not only as we come to service here to honor you, but after service, we're going to have a congregational meeting so we can do the work of your church. It is not ours, this is yours. We pray all of this in your son's most holy name. Amen. Let's open with our praise songs. Amen. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you have created me in that place of my sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Testament reading this morning is in Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, 
that she has conceived from the Lord's hand double all for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid, says the towns of Judah. Here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is God's word in the Old Testament. Our New Testament reading today is 2 Peter 3, verses 8 through 14. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, so some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought to, you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But he, in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with them. Please rise for the gospel reading. Today's gospel comes from Mark, chapter 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John, who wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. 
After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of our Lord. You may be seated for our praise song. Well, if you look in your bulletin, you'll notice that the message is righteousness and peace kiss. We're going to do something different. And as Lutherans, we're always good about changing things up with that. And that's because, again, that was Pastor Lee's sermon. Uh, today's sermon comes from Pastor Shower, as I alluded to before. But he was not just uh, so grace gracious fault to uh, provide this sermon for me that I could deliver to you. He also provided a PowerPoint for us. So as we go through this, uh, you will have a, uh, there will be a little slideshow that kind of plays through with some of this. So uh, I believe you will enjoy it as a rather good one. Now, this is based off of the reading from our epistle or the New Testament reading instead of the gospel reading. But um, in this time of Advent that we have, it fits quite, quite well for us. So, a time of waiting. Imagine you need to call customer support. So you tap in the number and then you wait. Then there's a voice. Thank you for waiting. Your call is important to us. We've all heard those words you know you're going to be put on hold. It's not a human voice, but from a computer. 
often the computer voice will tell you how long the wait time is expected to be. <clears throat> the waiting is the hardest part. Even saying Tom Petty in his hit song, The Waiting, along with the Heartbreakers back in 1981. Back then, it was certainly true that waiting was the hardest part. Many of us are old enough to remember 1981. Imagine, for example, waiting in the waiting room of a doctor's office back in the 1980s. No smartphone and only some outdated magazines, perhaps, to look through. You would have had no contact with the world beyond that antiseptic, boring room until you were finally called back to the examination room where you would wait some more, this time without the magazines. No wonder why they call us patients. Today, we have multiple entertainment options right at our fingertips to keep us occupied while we wait. But despite all of that technology, waiting is still hard. We wait at airports, in the security lines, the boarding lines. We wait in waiting rooms. We wait in traffic. We wait at the post office. We wait at the bank. We even wait for a human when calling customer service, which sometimes never happens. We wait, and our patience runs thin. A little planning, however, can make that waiting time productive and perhaps even fun. For example, here's a list of some things someone came up with probably while he or she was waiting to mail a Christmas package at the local post office. These ideas can help you endure your waiting while boarding a flight from Chicago to visit a relative over the holidays. Strike up a conversation with a stranger and learn their story. Work through your unread emails. Nobody likes to do this, but it's a great way to burn an hour or three. Make an appointment with your dentist or any of those other medical types that you have been dreading to do but need to see. It will make the current waiting seem less painful by comparison. If you can find an outlet, recharge your device batteries. Even better, offer to share your charger with someone else. It's a great conversation starter. Ask whoever is next to you a little bit about their favorite band or podcast and then give it a listen right then and there. Flip through your phone's photo gallery and delete pictures you don't need. Zoom or FaceTime your parents, grandparents, kids, grandkids, and catch up with them. These are some great ideas if you have a couple of hours to kill. But what if that wait time is going to be a little bit longer? like maybe a couple thousand years. That's the dilemma that the early church was facing after Jesus' ascension to heaven. He had promised to return, and many in the church believed that that return was imminent. As time passed, however, and as persecution of Christians intensified, the waiting became the hardest part. In fact, some were beginning to question whether Jesus would return at all. That's the situation that Peter addresses. This second letter, which is a follow-up to the first letter that bears his name as well, reads more like a theological instruction manual than a typical letter, and for good reason. In the first letter, the writer encourages the church, which is being pressured by external forces, while here in the second letter, he addresses the problems arising from internal sources, namely false teachers who were skeptical about Jesus' return and whose teaching had encouraged looser ethical and moral behavior. The letter reminds the church that Jesus will indeed return as promised to bring justice and abolish evil, ushering in the new creation, and that the way they conduct themselves as they wait for his return will have implications for eternity. Peter understands that the waiting is the hardest part, but what seems like a long, slow waiting period for Christ's return is actually a gift from God. The Lord is not slow or tardy, but rather extends his own patience to allow time for people to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. 
The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. In the interim, even if it is a long interim, Peter asks, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy lives and godly lives. A new heaven and earth are coming in which where righteousness dwells. So what should we be doing while we wait? The short answer for Peter is that those who follow Christ should begin living the righteous life of the future new creation as though it had already arrived. There will be a period of waiting, but it's not to be a passive one which we, like the disciples of the Ascension, keep staring up to the sky, waiting for the Lord's arrival. Instead, Peter says that there are certain things that we should strive to do in the interim. If we look closely at the message of 2 Peter as a whole, we discover it is a list of at least five things that we can and must do while waiting for the new advent. First, Remember the promise of the first advent. Peter opens the letter by reminding his readers of the faith that they received through the righteousness of our God, Savior, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a powerful witness to Christ's reincarnation. Jesus is both God and Savior. Peter and the other disciples were eyewitnesses to the incarnation of God in Christ, remembering the voice of God during the transfiguration, proclaiming, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. As we celebrate this season of Advent, it's a chance for us to remember that, again, God has come to us in person, in Christ, and in doing so, God has confirmed the truthfulness of his promises toward us. The Lord for whom we wait is always true to his word. Second, grow in the image of Christ. When Jesus returns, Peter urges his readers to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. In fact, this was the way we were meant to be from the beginning when we were created in the image of God. We became subject to corruption because of human sin. But because of what Christ has done in his life, death and resurrection and ascension, we can once again become participants of the divine nature. So Peter urges us to make every effort to support our faith in Christ through acting out the virtues of goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. Focusing on these things will keep us from being ineffective and unproductive in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Peter means by living lives of holiness and godliness, lives that look more and more like Jesus. Third, dig deep into the scriptures. Peter and the other disciples had seen all the promises of the scriptures confirmed in Jesus. He encourages his readers to dig deep into the scriptures and be attentive to them as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. When we read the scriptures, we recognize that the message about Jesus wasn't a human invention, but came through people who spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Daily reading of the scriptures, particularly when read in the community within the church, keeps us from sliding into interpretations that suit ourselves and our desires and guards against false prophets and their destructive heresies. In a world where everyone is ready to overload their phones with information and opinions, Scripture calls us back to the truth of God revealed by those inspired by the Holy Spirit. We must always be prepared to compare the words of those to the word of God. As Peter puts it, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. When we engage the scriptures daily, we strengthen our memory of God's word, and we more consistently live it out each day. 
Fourth, pay attention to what it is that masters you. In chapter two, Peter criticizes those false teachers for promising freedom while being slaves of corruption. And then he makes a profound statement. People are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Incredibly true. As we move through the Advent season, that's a great question to ponder. What is it that masters us? To what have we become a slave? Is it money, work, power, something else? As Bob Dylan once sang in a gospel song, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Who are you going to serve? Fifth, use your time wisely. Peter urges his readers to bear in mind that the Lord's patience means salvation. In this interim period, as we wait the return of Jesus, we have the opportunity, excuse me, the opportunity to use the time God has given us to share our faith with others. Peter, like the Apostle Paul, spent every waking minute looking to share good news about Jesus with anyone he met then did it with a sense of urgency and anticipation in Christ's coming. According to Peter, Paul's writings may have been hard to understand and were vulnerable to being twisted by the ignorant and dishonest people, but they were nonetheless powerful because they were designed to impact others with the gospel. Disciples of Jesus recognized that God has given us time to spread the word about Jesus, and we need to use that time wisely. Our conversations, through, excuse me, through conversations we might have with people in the waiting room or on a plane, those are opportunities to have spiritual conversations as the Spirit leads. As Peter says in his first letter, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. The waiting might be the hardest part of being a Christian, but it's also the most important part. God has given us the tools and the time to bring his good news to the world in anticipation of a second advent. Let us wait well. We continue with our prayers of the people. Lord, as we are gathered here today in your church, we ask that in this Advent season, you allow us the power and the strength. You have given us the time, as we heard in the message prepared by Pastor Shower. Let us use that time wisely. Let us use it productively so that we can accomplish your work here on earth. We ask that you give us the blessing of this season on our church here and our members of our congregation as we continue to look for answers and guidance for what you want with our congregation. We pray for our leaders not only here in the Lutheran Church, but we also pray for the leaders of our country and around the world that they recognize their responsibility for the common moral good. We ask for prayers for the country and the divisions that we see, that the anger, the hate, that that may be lifted, and we can see that we are together creations in your world. We should not war we shall make peace. We ask for those blessings, particularly for the situations in Ukraine and Israel and the other countries where war, strife, famine, the powers of the devil are corrupting those who are not listening and believing in your word. We also ask for guidance and blessings today for our congregational meetings. So again, we can do the important work of your church here. We ask for healing. We ask for healing for Dottie, 
as her cancer has returned. We pray for Greg, who also has kidney cancer, along with other health issues. We pray for Julie with chemotherapy, the recovery with what that takes. We pray for Joan with her brain cancer, that you may ease her pain, release her from suffering. We pray for Bob and Jim as they also continue to heal, as they are doing much better. We give thanks for that as well. We pray for Mary Margaret, that she may have answers to her ongoing medical issues that she's experiencing. We also continue to pray for Pastor John, but we also give thanksgiving that it is your will that he become better and that he is serving your church even if he is not able to be in attendance with us. We pray for Neil with his continued recovery that you will allow that to, again, complete his work, especially as he is serving as president of our congregation. We pray for Nancy who had her knee replacement, that the healing, the physical therapy, the recovery will be quick and less painful. We pray for Sylvia, for the Thanksgiving, for the recovery and the therapy that she is also undergoing. We continue to pray for Randy. Prayers for strength, health, being able to give him the guidance so that way he will be able to return to us as a regular congregation. We pray for John, who is diagnosed with ALS, a debilitating disease. We pray for strength, comfort, and healing for him. We pray for George, for the thanksgiving and the good results and outcomes of his scans, that he can still continue to be with us. We pray for Alexis, who is diagnosed with early Alzheimer's, a horrible disease. But we ask that you be with her, grant her healing, give her strength, so that way her loved ones can still continue to be with her. We also pray for Beverly, who has a test coming up scheduled. We pray for good results, as she does so much for your church here in this congregation that we appreciate so dearly. Of course, we must also pray for Pastor Lee with his mild stroke. We pray that you will give him the strength to be able to return to us so that he can immediately return back to the work that you have set forth for him as a called and ordained servant. We also pray for John Gabrielson. We found out he is in the hospital with high blood pressure. We ask that you would give grant him healing and strength so that he too may be able to return along with his son Jay. We ask for comfort on the Marks family as Keith Marks passed away on Wednesday, the 22nd. Prayers for comfort in that time. Even though he is gone to be with our Lord, it is us that suffer the loss, but we know that it is not permanent. As our message said, it is the waiting, but we will once again all be back and together. We pray all of these things in your son's name and in the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Grant us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.
then I have to come up here and read the announcements. <laughs> and we actually don't have too many announcements today. Uh, the first, uh, the preschool program next Sunday that I will be uh, leading service for, prayer service, we have already 38 people signed up for. So we should have a fairly full uh, sanctuary, which will be very nice. We will appreciate that. You get to see all the little kids come up here and perform. It's, such a, it's always so much fun. Uh, Bev will be out of the office tomorrow, as we mentioned with our prayers. So if you need anything, realize there might be a slight delay with that, or Diana can get uh, in touch with whatever we need for that. Christmas Eve, hopefully you've done most of your shopping because it's that time of the season where the stores are going to be packed. We will have Christmas Eve service at 1030 a.m. because I believe 10, 10 a.m. <laughs> Dates and time. It's written here and I can't read it. It's amazing I'm a teacher, right? 10 a.m. And then we will also have a candlelight service at 5.30 p.m. Hopefully not a.m. on that one. P.m. on that one. So we'll actually have two services that day because I believe that is our Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll have... Uh, regular Sunday service, and then we'll also have the 5.30 candlelight service. If you have not attended, that is one of my favorite services of the entire year. We'll also have Christmas Day service at 10 a.m. So again, if you are able, if you're still in town, please join us for that. Uh, point Setias, these are actually due today. So um, it's okay, small mistakes. So if you would like to order a Point Setia, please make sure you turn that in uh, give that money over to Bev. And then also we will have a congregation meeting shortly. I'm assuming we'd probably like a break to get a cup of coffee and a little treat and things out there. Do we know what time it is, Diana? Um, just, you know, I would say maybe by, it's 1047, so maybe like 11. 11? Okay. So we'll try to be back in here between 11 and 1105. Oh, I will. Hold on. Are there any announcements from the congregation? Hearing none, I will dismiss you to the uh, fellowship hall, but still be sure to wave to the camera. Thank you.